Deputy Director of the Hurricane Research Division that is part of the Atlantic and Oceanographic Meteorological Laboratory. Um, and so if anyone can go on the chat box and let me know where you are joining us from, that would be most helpful. I am coming to you from Miami. Look, we've got people from Orlando. We've got folks from NOAA headquarters, from Weather Service headquarters. Brought to you by NOAA's Southeast and Caribbean Regional Collaboration Team, also known as CCART. CCART is one of eight regional collabor collaboration teams across the country. And the purpose of these teams is to look across all of NOAA and to uh, promote and, and work on issues that impact the NOAA, impact our country and NOAA's mission. The webinar, this webinar will be recorded and will be available on the CCART website in about a week or so. As a, courtesy, as a courtesy to our presenter, all attendees are muted. If you have a question, as I just asked you guys a question earlier, please type it in the question box and we'll get to it. Um, and due to the high volume of attendees today, some of the slides might be delayed, but let us know through the question box if you are experiencing any, any issues with uh, video or, or voice or audio, I should say. All right, so I would like to introduce you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and our presenter will come on and share his screen. I would like to introduce you, Brian Lamar. He is the meteor meteorologist in charge for the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Tampa Bay, Ruskin area of Florida. And he's gonna to talk to us about a look a look back at Hurricane Ian. A lot of us uh, that live in, in hurricane prone areas remember Hurricane Ian from last year. And so we're gonna hear what it was like for forecasters and what they do and then what happens afterwards. I mean, some of us saw some pictures, but hearing firsthand of what Ian and his colleagues had, had to uh, deal with and overcome. Brian? All right, thank you, Shirley, and uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, looks um, like now the screen has I'm gone not away. Seeing, yes, your screen has gone away. Let's see if we can get that back. All right, let me go off camera and... It looks like right when it shared, it went away, Shirley. Let's see. Yeah. Here. Are you still seeing the screen, though? I am, I just see your wallpaper. Oh, yeah, that is, all right, hang on one second. I'm gonna stop sharing. Yep. Yeah, it looks like it disappeared right when you gave me the control. Let's try this again. Let's see here. Okay, are you able to share? the screen back with me again or are you still seeing it uh no let's see if i can have uh, uh no we're not seeing it i will make you presenter again actually you're still presenter okay let's try this one more time okay so we see it there there we go all right perfect let's just make sure it's working there okay good all right again uh yeah thank you for having me shirley and thanks to the NOAA uh, southeast caribbean regional team uh, this is a storm that really impacted uh, everyone here uh, at the National Weather Service Tampa office and, and myself going through a lot of the uh, damage survey and also talking to the people that were really impacted by this hurricane. And what I want to do is kind of, since I know we have a really diverse audience from, you know, some are meteorologists, some are not, some are in NOAA, some are not, I want to kind of go through uh, a little bit of you know, uh, prep work, and actually now they're not they're not even advancing, Shirley. So I'm not sure if there's something that's happening on your yes. end. Is, yeah, no, we end. just we're still in the first slide here, Brian. We're not seeing yeah. any. Yeah, let's let's see here. Let me check it out again. There it goes. That's second slide. Okay, very good. Okay, what I'd like to do is kind of just kind of go over the season itself and really looking back to 2022, I've always liked this slide from the uh, NOAA National Centers for Environmental Information showing pretty much the entire country and the economic impacts of all of the weather and climate disasters. And as we saw, there were 18 different weather and climate disasters that impacted the United States last year. 
and you can see on the bottom you can see the hurricane symbols and and we see anywhere from hurricane ian hurricane fiona and hurricane nicole uh, we can definitely see the impacts that came across the, the florida and the southeast us and i'm going to be talking a little bit more about you know hurricane ian as we you know go through the presentation but looking at the the entire atlantic basin you know what do we do when we go out there and we meet with emergency managers when we talk with media, when we talk with the public and schools, and we, we talk about the hurricane season, and we know it runs from June 1st to November 30th, but we have also seen storms that have formed earlier than that, you know, outside of the traditional boundary of the hurricane season. Uh, we've seen storms form in May, we've seen storms form even in April. So again, we're, we're coming up very closely on the start of the traditional climatological hurricane season. And so the National Weather Service and many other parts of NOAA are very active in the public outreach and education program. And what can people expect? And, and we, we can look back at the Gulf of Mexico. Um, as Shirley mentioned, I'm the meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service Tampa office. I also have the great opportunity to lead the NOAA Gulf of Mexico regional collaboration team. And I always found this image pretty powerful uh, from a colleague in the Weather Channel that put it together. Looking at the last handful of years, you know, since 2017, these are the category four and category five hurricanes that have made landfall just in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see pretty much every state was impacted and, and definitely a lot of significant devastation, loss of life, loss of property and, uh, basically a lot of storms that have resulted in subsequent research on how can we actually improve as we go forward. But again, uh, I'll be talking about some of these named hurricanes as we go through the climatology and then focusing on Hurricane Ian. And this office here in Tampa, we were also impacted by Hurricane Irma in 2017. Now looking at you know the actual climatology of what occurred last year, you can see, I kind of put it, uh, you know, the numbers at the top in parentheses, that's really what should happen during a given year. So last year, 2022 for the hurricane season, you were, there were 14 named storms, eight of those became hurricanes and two became major hurricanes. Now in parentheses, that's what typically should happen in a given year, 14 named storms, seven hurricanes and three major. So you can see we were slightly above normal we were still in that la nina kind of moving into the neutral period uh, for the el nino la nina cycle and as you may have heard uh you know in the media and across NOAA, you know we're actually moving into an el nino pattern and does that really mean that we're not going to see any hurricanes of course not uh, it may be the latter half of the hurricane season that maybe starts getting impacted a little bit more el nino tends to reduce the number of uh, storms that form, but it doesn't eliminate them. So that's why we always say it only takes one, as I have at the top of the slide. And so we'll, we'll be uh, looking to see how the season actually evolves. But but again, last year, uh, you know, like I mentioned, the season started June 1st and November 30th. The first storm uh, formed in early June, and that was Alex. And the last storm that I'll talk about, Hurricane Nicole, that also impacted the state of Florida, uh, formed on November 7th. But the significant impacts uh, Ian and Fiona for Puerto Rico and Nicole, but Ian and Nicole having their impacts in the state of Florida. And looking at, at this slide here, uh, this actually should be an animation. Uh, not sure why it's not looping, but in any case, uh, this right here was on the early morning hours of Wednesday, September 28th. And it's also showing what we call the, the pretty much the GLM, the Geo Lightning Mapper. And you can see the lightning forming around the eye of Hurricane Ian. And this is a very high resolution zoomed in version of uh, Hurricane Ian, right about to make landfall. Uh, landfall occurred about 3.05 p.m. on that Wednesday afternoon, September 28th. And that again, we're looking at the coastline of Southwest Florida. And this right here is the radar imagery from the National Weather Service here in Ruskin. So this is the Tampa Bay Area National Weather Service radar. And you can see the very well-defined eyewall and also the very strong thunderstorm activity that's rotating around Ian, especially along the northern northwestern quadrant. And this isn't unusual, but we usually see on the right-hand side of the storm, 
uh, most of the heavy rainfall and thunderstorm activity. But there was also this really weak frontal boundary that was lingering over Florida Panhandle. And it was actually interacting with Hurricane Ian and enhancing some of the thunderstorm activity that was occurring on the north and northwest side of the eyewall. But as I'll show you coming up, we'll be seeing what were the actual impacts. And Ian was a horrific storm uh, by many measures, whether it be storm surge or inland flooding or wind. But Ian was definitely a water storm. And I'll be showing you, you know, some of the impacts as we move forward. But a lot of people always ask, what, what do we do at a local field office in the National Weather Service leading up to, during, and following a hurricane? And so this, this is a very interesting timeline because it shows we, we start well outside the season. And I'll be honest with you, here we are, you know, almost starting the 2023 hurricane season. And we're talking about Hurricane Ian from last year. Uh, we, Hurricane Ian has been the topic of many presentations since landfall on September 28th. And I'm sure that will continue as we move into the next several months, if not years. But what we do is we start off months before hurricane season, during the off season, I should say, and we, we start doing tabletop exercises, we do drills, we have hurricane exercises that we do with our emergency manager partners and media and universities and other, other uh, government and non-government offices. So we, we work with them to ensure that they really know what to do when these storms come our way. And as we get closer towards the actual event, so you can see the timeline, it's talking about preparedness, planning, response, and recovery. So during the planning phase, this could be anywhere from a week out before the hurricane or tropical storm makes landfall. And we're gonna be sending out email briefings. Uh, I remember during Hurricane Irma in 2017, we started our email briefings when Irma was east of Puerto Rico. So again, we ramp up pretty quick and early just to make sure that people have the information they need. And Hurricane Ian was a little faster. You may remember it forming, you know, well south of the Western Caribbean, south of Cuba. It started rapidly intensifying. It went through one of those famous eyewall replacement cycles as it moved off Cuba and then moved towards the southwest of Florida. Uh, it, as you may have heard recently, uh, the National Hurricane Center and its reanalysis upgraded Hurricane Ian to a Category 5 when it was offshore. So this was before it made landfall. It still made landfall as a Category 4 uh, with very, very significant and catastrophic impacts. And as we look at the response phase, this is where we're going to be working hand in hand with emergency management, sometimes actually in the Emergency Operations Center. Shortly after Ian, uh, myself and uh, several colleagues from uh, the National Weather Service here in Ruskin, uh, went down to the emergency operations centers uh, in Southwest Florida and actually met with the emergency managers. We are working with them to gather information for GIS mapping of flood impacts, uh, mapping for wind impacts, and, and actually developing uh, data for what was actually occurring when Ian made landfall. And the recovery phase, which is going on to this day, you know, you, you may have heard uh, in Fort Myers, Lee County, Charlotte County, and surrounding counties that they're still dealing with the aftermath from Ian. And again, we are several, several months away uh, outside of the actual landfall. But looking at something that we actually did, so again, this is leading up to the storm. This is about three to five days before Hurricane Ian made landfall. And you can see some of the graphics. These are from the National Hurricane Center. So they're the experts in the track and the intensity of these storms. And so what we do at the local weather forecast office level is we're taking that information and we're we're localizing it. We're saying, okay, here is the uh, the track. This is going to be the, the potential track or, you know, a lot. A lot of people call it the cone. You know, I like to call it now the, the potential track of where the storm will go. And what does that mean to the local area? So we're going to be looking at that and saying, okay, what is the timing of the earliest reasonable arrival of tropical storm force winds and hurricane winds? How does that impact school closures? How does it impact shelter openings? So these are all the things that we're doing at the local level. And we're, we're in constant communication with the decision makers. So they have this information for when they brief uh, officials for evacuation. So again, we do this uh, basically about two hours after every official advisory from the Hurricane Center. So you can see 7 a.m., 1 p.m., 7 p.m. And sometimes, although rare, we'll do an overnight, uh, usually when a landfall is occurring and we are all sleeping here in the actual forecast office 
as we did during Hurricane Ian. As we get a little bit closer, you know, this is a 24, 36, 48 hours before impacts. This is where we're now looking at more high resolution storm surge information, higher resolution wind information. And we're able to have the tropical storm or hurricane watcher warning, uh, the very critical storm surge watcher warning. And also, as you see on the right hand side, you know, we're looking at how our rivers are actually going to be responding to the significant rainfall. And working, we're working with the National Water Center uh, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We're working with the Weather Prediction Center in Maryland, who will be issuing the excessive rainfall outlooks. So again, uh, if you're not familiar with the National Weather Service, we have 122 offices, just like the one I'm sitting in today. And we also have several national centers that are looking at the, the broader picture and they have expertise in such things as you know, the National Hurricane Center. We have the Storm Prediction Center looking at tornado threat. Uh, they're out of Norman, Oklahoma. And the Weather Prediction Center up in Maryland that is looking at the uh, excessive rainfall impacts. Now, if we were to drill it down a little bit more, this is showing again a hyper resolution of how we use information from the National Hurricane Center. This one is looking at the most likely arrival of tropical storm force winds. Now, this isn't an example that I pulled off. This is actually what we briefed for Hurricane Ian, and this was the day before landfall. So again, this was Tuesday, September 27th. Uh, we're responsible for 15 counties across West Central and Southwest Florida. And those are the 15 counties on the right-hand side, and we're giving them the time that we feel that they're gonna start seeing the earliest arrival of winds. And, and that is significant, like I said earlier, it's significant for emergency operations. They close bridges when we have wind speeds either sustained or frequent gusts of 40 miles an hour greater. So right at the tropical storm threshold, uh, Pinellas County uh, on the west side of Tampa Bay be basically gets cut off on most of the access because of the bridges will be uh, shut down during tropical storm force winds. So again, we're, we're working hand in hand with the emergency operations center to ensure they have that information. This right here, we call it HTI. This is the hurricane threats and impacts. And it focuses on uh, those four main elements uh, that are often produced during tropical storms and hurricanes, the wind, the flooding rain, the surge and the tornadoes. So we're looking at, for example, you can see on the map where it has Sarasota, where it has Tampa, and you can see how, say for example, the surge, you know, you see that there are certain portions of the coastline that are actually under a threat and other portions that are not. And so again, we're, we're looking at the data. Uh, we know the, the area responsibility that we're responsible for very well. Uh, we know how rivers respond, we know how the bays respond, and we're helping the decision makers make very critical life-threatening uh, decisions. And we also translate this in Spanish. We have two Spanish-speaking meteorologists, uh, Kaylee Delerme and Gideon Azayas here at the National Weather Service in Tampa. And we also work with other offices who have Spanish-speaking meteorologists in Miami and San Juan, uh, Melbourne, and elsewhere across the country. The National Weather Service also runs a national Spanish team uh, called MAS, so Multimedia Assistance in Spanish. And these teams are activated during these high-impact events to ensure that uh, vulnerable communities, underserved communities, are getting the information that they need in multiple formats. So we're also doing television interviews in Spanish with Telemundo and other local TV and national TV uh, to ensure that information is getting out to the public. Now this one here, you know, I mentioned, you know, we all have heard of the cone. Uh, there's many uh, phrases that uh, discuss this area. Again, I like to call it, you know, the the potential track area. You know, it, it looks like the, you know, the cone, the cone of uncertainty. It's only one piece to a much larger puzzle. And there's a lot of discussion on this. And as Shirley has talked about in past webinars, uh, in her capacity at Hurricane Research Division, working closely with uh, academia, media, private sector, and the National Hurricane Center, uh, there's going to be uh, changes to how we message what the cone means and we're as this example right here you know you can see tropical storm you know in blue and red you can see where tropical storm and hurricane watches and warnings may be where storm surge watches and warnings may be and also the extent of tropical storm force winds so it's really not just where the storm is going that is extremely important you know the cone's not going to go away but it's it likely will evolve to providing additional information in conjunction with where the storm's going to go because just because Ian made landfall on Fort Myers Beach on that September 28th Wednesday afternoon 
people lost their life farther inland because of inland flooding. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that moving up. So again, looking at a zoomed in version of that track, you can see here a lot of different threats that are occurring. So again, look how wide that cone is. This was gonna be on Sunday morning, and I'll step through it in a little bit. This was Sunday morning's forecast, and much of the west coast of Florida and the panhandle is within that cone of uncertainty, within that potential track area. But for verification purposes, we put in the area, this is where winds were greater than 50 miles per hour. So this is what actually occurred, and, and look where that occurred in reference to uh, that cone area. And now look at another aspect of it. This is where the massive amount of rainfall occurred, six to 27 inches. So again, it's not a typo, that is 27 inches. So again, look at the area of the cone of where that impact was. And also the storm surge warning, look at that area, Southwest Florida. And I will say, and I'll show you in a bit, the very first advisory from the National Hurricane Center on Friday morning, 5 a.m., September 25th, the track was exactly where Ian went. And of course, there were some fluctuations, and I'll talk about that, but this is the very first advisory. So this is before Ian was even named. So this was a tropical depression. So Ian was a tropical depression at this time. It was south, of, well southwest of Puerto Rico, north of South America. And look at the landfall point. That is where Ian actually made landfall. So the, the research over the years, the innovation, the technology, the National Hurricane Center has greatly improved track forecasting. And as we said, probably about anywhere from seven, I'd say about seven to 10 years ago, you know, I was always out there talking to media and everyone else in the weather service was saying, well, you know, rapid intensification is where we really need to improve. We're really not that good on rapid intensification. We don't say that anymore. Uh, the, the last five, five to eight years has seen significant improvements in the science and technology and forecasting of rapid intensification. We saw that with Hurricane Michael in 2018. We saw that with Hurricane Ian last year. Uh, it's rare to have actually seen a forecast of rapid intensification, and that's what the National Hurricane Center did with Hurricane Ian. Now, stepping forward a little bit, so you saw that initial forecast. It was a challenging forecast. You know, don't get me wrong. Uh, the emergency managers will will attest to that as well. I will say that the landfall point, you know, Fort Myers Beach, never left the cone the entire time. But for many people making decisions outside of being a scientist and and making you know meteorological decisions, it's it's easy to see how okay, well, you if you're only looking at the cone, so to say, then you're thinking, well, things are improving across Southwest Florida but not when there is a hurricane watcher warning, you know, that is when people really need to, you know, take things seriously. So again, this was Sunday where the uh, the center, if you will, the center track line of potential tracks was up towards Apalachicola. This right here, if you're familiar with the HVX or the Hervac software, what I did is kind of pulled off uh, different tracks. These are the advisories. If you're able to see, I don't know if my cursor shows up well, you can see these number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine on these lines. So again, these were the tracks from uh, you know early, early Saturday morning to Sunday afternoon. So there was a leftward shift, okay? So the track was shifting to the west. Now, if we look at Monday morning, that track, you know, the, the average, the potential, the center line, if you will, is starting to shift a little bit east. And you can see here the tracks. Again, look at the numbers, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So now there's a shift. That's occurring. So this is very late Saturday night, Sunday morning, 2 a.m. until Monday afternoon. And now this is when the media was really anchoring on the city of Tampa. So again, Tampa Bay, you can see in this particular one has an M that's major hurricane category three or higher. And that is a, a visualization of Tampa Bay looks like they're going to be under the gun. They're going to have a direct landfall. But what's important to see on this map, and this is available you know, from, from you know, the Hurricane Center website, hurricanes.gov, look, look at the blue, look at the red, look at the yellow, look at the areas outside that cone, all the way up to Jacksonville. You know, that, that's significant. That's showing you the impacts. That's showing you where and how far out will the wind impacts be for tropical storm force or hurricane? Where will the storm surge uh, be? And again, so, there, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, there's probably more on this picture. But we, we in the 
National Weather Service can definitely do and improve our messaging uh, strategies to ensure that people really understand, you know, what are the variations? What does all this mean? And it's difficult. It's difficult to pe for people to understand graphics sometimes, uh, uh, and especially graphics that are shared on social media without any context. And, and I think there's a lot of pros and cons with social media. It's helped us tremendously. But when an image like this gets shared on social media without anyone talking about it, it's hard for people to make decisions. And it's very easy for these images to get out on social media. So now this is uh, early Monday morning into Tuesday afternoon. And you can see, again, the tracks are shifting to the east. And this is Wednesday morning. So this is the day of landfall. This is just less than 12 hours, about 10 hours away from landfall. And this is you know, where uh, Hurricane Ian made landfall. This image I've been using quite a bit uh, since Ian made landfall. And, and I kind of put a little catchy title, you know, when can 20 miles equal 125 miles? So uh, for everyone that may not be familiar with the geography here, it's, it's 125 miles from uh, Tampa to Fort Myers, if you were to draw a straight line. And the hurricane symbol on the bottom left is where Hurricane Ian was at 5 a.m. Uh, Wednesday, September 28, and it was moving off to the northeast uh, towards Fort Myers. Now, you've heard many times, most likely, that hurricanes can often wobble. Uh, they can shift. They can have a slight wobble to uh, left or right, north or south. If you were to have taken a slight shift of Hurricane Ian by 20 miles, <clears throat> so just 20 miles, that is not a difficult thing for a hurricane to do. So just a slight shift westward 20 miles, draw a line. Now that landfall is in Tampa Bay. If you were to take the original position of Hurricane Ian, shift it only 25 miles. So now we're looking at the right-hand side image. Draw a straight line, it's going to Cedar Key. So that is 256 miles away. So with Florida and likely Texas and likely many uh, locations on the East Coast of, of the United States, when you have a north-south facing coastline and you have a, a tropical storm or a hurricane uh, approaching at an angle, a very small shift in track can mean significant differences when it comes to impacts. And as we saw, Tampa Bay, we lost water, okay? We had negative surge, just like we did during Hurricane Irma in 2017. So water was leaving Tampa Bay during Ian, while 10 to 15 feet of water was surging into Charlotte Harbor. So very, very significant, and it makes decision-making uh, very challenging uh, when it comes to these types of storms. But looking at the actual impacts, these are the wind impacts from Hurricane Ian. So again, the landfalls were the center of the eyewall across the beach, and landfall was at Cayo Costa at 3.05 p.m. on that Wednesday. And it made landfall as a Category 4 uh, major hurricane. Uh, it made a second landfall. Once it moved over the barrier island into Charlotte Harbor, it made a second landfall at Punta Gorda. Uh, that's in Charlotte County, uh, still a Category 4, so about about three, uh, yeah, about hour and a half later, 4.35 p.m. And you can see the maximum wind. And looking at the storm surge, so again, this is a hindcast. Uh, I was working with Jamie Rome, the deputy director of the Hurricane Center, on on this image here. So again, this was hindcast. Uh, this is taking, okay, the actual track of Hurricane Ian, and then it runs the model on what would the storm surge be uh, with that exact track. And it was very, very close to what was actually sampled. Uh, I was down there, our WCM or Warning Coordination Meteorologist, Dan Noah, several of our meteorologists uh, were down there uh, doing damage surveys. And then there was a team from Houston, the Harris County Flood Control District, uh, Jeff Evans, the MIC in Houston, and and others uh, from here at the National Weather Service were down there and doing actual high watermark surveys, and and they they sampled and we did as well a, a swath of 10 to 15 feet on Fort Myers Beach and and a little bit on the on the mainland of uh, Lee County, which is where Fort Myers is, and there was actually a 15.4 foot uh, measurement in that area, and I'll show you some images from that. You know, I mentioned earlier how Ian was a water storm. You know, Ian was a beast when it comes to water, whether it be inland flooding from torrential rainfall or storm surge. We also have rivers that were down in that area, the Cluzhatchee River uh, that was coming in from Charlotte and uh, Charlotte Harbor and moving off to the northeast, you know, water moving up to that area and the, the massive storms that were flooding the area resulted in, uh, you know, up to 27 inches uh, where you can see on the, uh, the data on the right-hand side. And as mentioned, 
more people lost their life from inland flooding uh, and several, several uh, lost their life from storm surge. And, and you know, we, we don't use the word much in our statements, but I think we will in the future. You know, we, we will, you know, people drowned. You know, the, the people lost their life due to water. They lost their life due to trying to drive away from rapidly rising water. And this here, and I think I'm gonna, let's see here. I wanna go back one. Um, I wanna talk about this uh, for a little bit. When we were down there, in fact, I wanna, I'm gonna go on camera now just a little bit, just to talk about the um, the people aspect. And Shirley, can you confirm you're still seeing the slide or should I go off camera? We lost your slide there. Okay, seemed like when I went on camera, it goes away. Let's uh, let's go back down and bring it up again. And let's see here. Yeah, I don't know why it keeps doing this. I'm sorry, folks. Let me just uh, check here and see where I can get the slides again. There we go. And um, so we went down there and did a lot of interaction with media. We had we had a lot of local media. We had a lot of national media down there. Uh, this photo here, uh, I'm joined with uh, Pablo Santos. You know, a lot of us may know Pablo. Uh, he recently moved to the National Hurricane Center. He was the uh, meteorologist in charge of NWS Miami. So he was my counterpart in Miami, and now he's at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, Pablo and some of his team came up, and we we did a lot of uh, the surveying in that area. And what we saw was was devastating, to put it bluntly. And you likely seen a lot of the imagery since then. Uh, you can see on the bottom left, a home with uh, water nearly up to the roof line. And this is significant because how are people, if people are in that home, what are they going to do? And what if they did not evacuate? And I'm gonna talk about that. We call it vertical evacuation. I've been working with a lot of folks and some social scientists, Laura Myers from Alabama, Jeff Evans, uh, National Weather Service Houston, uh, Jen Hubbard here at, here at my office here, uh, just talking about, okay, the message of last resort. And this was something that we discussed last week at the Florida Governor's Hurricane Conference. And again, the, the bottom middle image is Highway 70. This is well inland, well, very well inland. And this is where flooding rains have cut off transportation and also people lost their lives from the flooding rain. This here, again, doing national media, you, you can see the, the middle image here. There was a woman that was inside this home. She survived. This, this was a miracle in itself. Uh, there was a widely uh, publicized video on social media. Uh, the woman's name is Karen and she was up there taking video. Uh, the top middle windows was her kitchen and she was taking a, a very, you know, popular video looking outward and the water was coming into that second floor window. So she was up to her waist in uh, water, storm surge, uh, as Ian was making landfall. And fortunately, this that structure was built strong enough for her to survive. But you can see it's designed a way where the bottom portion is meant to blow out uh, so the water can pass through. Uh, it, it didn't in most locations there, but uh, you could actually see a barge floating by uh, when she was taking that video. On the right-hand image, uh, one of our senior meteorologists, Jennifer Hubbard, uh, she was on that team with the Houston group that was in town, and, and that was the top of the storm surge. You know, she's not just holding that marker for a photo. That was measuring the high water mark uh, from storm surge. So very, very significant water storm. This one here, uh, this one always... Uh, tugs at my heart over here. Uh, this is a gentleman in in the, it's like a mini mart. It's a gas station. It's it's in Fort Myers on the mainland side, uh, Main Street in San Carlos, if you're familiar. And on the right-hand side, I'm actually on that side with Pablo from Miami. And see this door on the right-hand side? I'm going to show you what it looks like when we opened it. But this gentleman, we got to talk with him and a few of our other meteorologists uh, from the office here in Tampa, He's shoveling out mud and everything, all the debris. He and the owner of that business were inside. They did not leave. They stayed. Uh, they were. They wanted to make sure their business uh, was safe. Uh, yeah, something not recommended. Fortunately, they they survived to tell the story. But again, this gentleman uh, told me that he was there. The owner was there. Uh, the storm surge was coming in, and they were outside holding onto the roof. 
he showed me his hands. They were all, you know, they were cut up. He was holding out of the roof for three hours as the storm surge was coming in and then it was going out. <clears throat> this is where I usually end up uh, losing the voice a little bit here telling this story. Uh, but as the water was going out, um, you know, he told me that, you know, he saw people, he saw bodies floating by him. And, and I want to tell you these horrific stories, and there's more, because I think it's important, not only for the people that lost their life, but that's what we're going to be doing movie, moving forward. We're, we're going to tell the stories. We're going to show the imagery uh, of the impacts, because I think that's really how people are, are, are it's really going to sink in for people to understand what can a major hurricane do to your area. So again, he told me the bodies were floating by him, and, and he looked at them. Their eyes were open. And he told me, he says, their spirit was gone and they were floating by him. Um, you know, we we talk about PTSD, we talk about mental wellness, health wellness, uh, well-being. Um, you know, I, I, at, I froze hearing him tell this story. And I don't know if it was just human instinct that kicked in, but I just looked at him. I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, thank God you survived and you survived for a reason. And he um, he continued to tell me more, um, you know, they, they were outside again, holding on, there were people, uh, there were bodies uh, in trees. Uh, so again, this, a lot of people can't imagine this and, you know, imagine, you know, people being stuck in trees that have drowned. So uh, very significant. Uh, another aspect of this is uh, two of our folks, Dan Noah, Austin Flannery uh, from our office, uh, were doing helicopter operations with emergency response officials, and they were able to go out on the actual uh, Fort Myers Beach. Uh, they closed it to everyone else. Uh, moments after, uh, the governor of Florida and the president of the United States flew in, so they had to get out of there. But what they uh, what they saw, what they were told, uh, there were people still on the beach. Uh, that's why they were not letting uh, public go across. So they were doing recovery. Uh, so they were getting bodies. They were getting people out. Uh, they also found people that were tied to trees. So I want to say that again. <clears throat> there were people tied to trees on the beaches, you know, where they lived. And imagine why, okay? So we've all seen some of those videos of, you know, like flash floods, river flooding, and you see a fireman, you know, he's got a rope around him and someone's holding on to him and and he's walking out into the water trying to get someone. So now imagine that you're, you are, you did not evacuate and now you were on a beach 10 to 15 feet of water is coming at you. What do you do? So these people tied themselves to a tree when the water was still not over their head, but they tied themselves too low and they drowned. So it's it's horrific to think about, but this is what happens with major hurricanes hitting populated areas. You know, this is what happened with hurricanes across the Gulf of Mexico that I showed you on that from 2017, you know, the category four and five hurricanes. You know, think of Hurricane Harvey in Houston, Michael in the Panhandle, and the many hurricanes that hit Florida and Louisiana over the past several years. Uh, very, very, very horrific to think. Uh, and it happened here and uh, just feet away from where this uh, man is standing right now. Remember I told you to look at the door. So this door on the right-hand side, that's their office. Let's open the door. and. So I opened the door, looked up, and you can see that line. I, I hope everyone can see it. It's usually these high watermark lines are usually uh, more pronounced, you know, dirt, debris, leaves. This one's pretty clean. The water that came in, it did not, because uh, the door was shut, there was not a lot of debris, but there was still dirt, you know, in the water. So that's how high the water was there. So that's about, I'm six feet, you know, that was about maybe, maybe eight feet at that location. But again, 10 to 15 feet uh, was coming into the area along the beaches. Now this right here, uh, Jen Hubbard from our office put this together, showed it last week in West Palm Beach at the Florida Governor's Hurricane Conference. And we talk about last resort messaging, okay? Now, a week ahead of time, we're not gonna say, if you don't wanna evacuate, make sure you can go to a second floor. We're not gonna say that because we want people to evacuate. And we work with emergency managers and elected officials to give them the information. And then they're gonna be the ones that are gonna decide whether or not and when to evacuate. But when you're in the thick of it, okay, when you're Karen, who was in that home I showed you earlier, and you did not evacuate for whatever reason, and we'll talk about that uh, coming up, you have to go vertically, 
okay? And hopefully you have a vertical location. Not all of us have two-story homes. Not all of us have an attic. Uh, if we do, we may drown in the attic. So we tell people to bring axes with you. I mean, it's horrific to even say, but or to bring a chainsaw with you and know how to use it safely. Uh, you know, Hurricane Harvey, 2017, Houston, you know, talking to Jeff Evans out there, the MIC, and people were cutting themselves out of roofs and waiting for helicopters to rescue them. So again, this is a very powerful slide. You know, we don't like to have a lot of text, but it is what it is, and because there's so much important information, but last resort messaging, and it's something that social scientists are are doing research on, and it's really something that is needed. You know, if water is coming in very rapidly, you have got to either go vertically or walk to another location uh, safely before the water rises. But too many people drowned when the water was already surging in and they tried to drive away. Many of those cars ended up at the bottom of Charlotte Harbor or floating and, and they lost their life. Uh, very horrific. We, we saw a lot of comparisons to Hurricane Charlie, to Hurricane Ian. And, you know, I personally talked to people that said, well, we survived category four Hurricane Charlie in 2004, and you're telling us that category four Hurricane Ian is coming our way. So we survived then, so we stayed and we're gonna survive. Well, many people lost their life uh, who lived during Hurricane Charlie. And that gentleman that I showed earlier from the gas station mini mart, I asked him, what would you do next time? And he says, I'm, I'm leaving. He said, without a doubt, I'm done. You know, so he had to go through horror, a nightmare uh, to come to that decision. But you can see the stats on Hurricane Charlie versus Hurricane Ian. Uh, again, both category fours, every storm is different. It does not matter the category. The category just tells you what the wind speed uh, is on this storm, nothing about the impacts. You can see at the bottom, the max surge with Charlie was six in some spots close to seven feet. Uh, that's Fort Myers Beach, FMB. And you can see, uh, you know, two, almost three times the surge with Hurricane Ian because it was so much larger, the eye was so much bigger. And because of that, the wind field, uh, the radius of maximum wind, as we call it, the how far out do the hurricane and tropical storm force winds go, was so much greater with Ian than Charlie. And so it was pushing so much more water towards the Southwest Florida coastline. And looking quickly, you know, uh, this is hurricanes, you know, that have made landfall in the United States over the past 10 or more years. You can see, you know, the direct fatalities and, and what they correspond to. You can see storm surge, in, in many of these years is actually not the number one reason why people have drowned. You can see freshwater flooding, you know, the darker blue. Of course, last year, Ian, you know, had a significant amount of people that lost their lives from storm surge. Uh, you can see in, uh, you know, some of the big hurricane years, 2017, again, that's Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria. I believe that's when Hurricane Nate devastated Costa Rica, if memory serves. And then looking back the record years of 2020 and the very active years, 2021 and 22, uh, you could see in 2020, we've shown this uh, over the past couple of years, every single, I'll say it again, every single coastal county of the Gulf and the Atlantic was under a tropical storm watcher warning in 2020, obviously at different times, but because of the very active hurricane season, it is the most active hurricane season on record, it be, it surpassed the year of Katrina and Rita and William of 2005, and very, very significant. And you can see, again, the big ones across the Gulf of Mexico. Looking at the indirect fatalities, so this means how are people losing their life after the storm has made its impact? And some recent research is actually looking at several months after a storm, uh, impacts the area. I met a student, a, a PhD student from University of Southwest or University of South Florida, when I was at the hurricane conference uh, last week, and she's doing research on Hurricane Ian and the loss of life even up until last month. So again, it's very significant and long lasting. But you can see vehicle related. You can see cardiac arrest, carbon monoxide poisoning. Again, very very significant. You know, a lot of people bring in their generators into their garages. They don't want them stolen and they end up losing their life because of ventilation issues. So again, another area where we all have to work together and message this out. Uh, this right here, again, this is by state. So direct fatalities by state. 
not surprising, Florida, North Carolina, and Texas, uh, some of the big states where hurricanes are making landfall and some of the big states with very vast coastlines. And, and you can see uh, storm surge mostly from Ian, and you can see freshwater flooding mostly from Harvey uh, when looking at Florida and Texas. And now looking at the age groups, this is also significant when it comes to Hurricane Ian. Uh, the majority of the people that lost their life were over age 60 and many over the age of 75. So you can see the stats here. And again, freshwater flooding, storm surge are among the significant elements that are taking the lives of many people. So very similar looking at Ian's direct fatality. So again, 41 people uh, lost their life to storm surge, but uh, Ian was responsible for 66 direct lives. And, and those are all in Florida. Uh, so again, Ian was definitely a very devastating storm and just Ian specific only, you know, the direct fatalities. Uh, you can see here also extending in North Carolina uh, where there was a second landfall in South Carolina and also one in Virginia. But coming to the final portion of the presentation and then we'll open up to any questions and answers that may be out there. But uh, this right here, this was research that was done by uh, a researcher up in uh, up in New England, and this was after Hurricane Sandy. And talking to some uh, social scientists just last week, a lot of these numbers have not changed with some similar studies with hurricanes over the past five years. But this really talks about when do people leave, and you know, we we know when whenever there's a hurricane watch or warning, or, or the media starts showing you know tracks towards a certain area, you know, there's going to be people that are just they're going to be out. You know, they're they're very savvy to weather. They're very nervous about it. They don't want to deal with it. They're gone. And when I say they're gone, you know, if they're in Florida, they're probably going to Atlanta. They're probably going even farther north. Uh, there was someone in Southwest Florida in Fort Myers that was in Michigan. So they they definitely got out of the storm surge, uh, but they definitely went far north. You know, as far north as one may be able to go. So and then we're looking at you know towards the middle, the ones that'll think, okay, well. It's not going to come here. We're going to wait for a while. You know, we're going to wait for the next advisory. We're going to wait another day. The media is saying it's going towards Tampa, so we're good here in Fort Myers. And then they don't tune back because they think it's coming to Tampa for the direct landfall, even though they'll they'll still get surge and uh, heavy rainfall, even if it came to Tampa. But they don't tune back in, and then they're surprised by a major hurricane knocking on their door in six hours. And the ones, you know, the last couple, you know, the ones that are really reluctant, the diehards that you know, they're just not leaving. And and those are the ones that we're really trying to figure out how can we reach them in ways. Like the gentleman I showed, you know, he's he said he knew the storm was coming. He knew it was going to be that. And he said he was staying. You know, we had the people that survived Hurricane Charlie, you know, category four. So they're staying for another category four. And many people did not survive. Um, you know, we personally talked to people that said, we knew the hurricane was coming, but we didn't think it would be that bad. So there's that element also. And I want to share with you one that I had never heard of. You know, I've been in the weather service. It's, it's going to be 29 years this year and been in charge of this office uh, for 16. You know, been through a lot of hurricanes here and in Texas, even Maryland with um, Isabel in 2003. And I never heard what I'm about to tell you. There, there were some folks that uh, we heard from and they said they did not want to leave their home because they were afraid they would not be allowed to go back. And what I mean by that, because I, I asked, and they, some of these family members have dementia, uh, they have Alzheimer's, and they were, they were living in their home by themselves. And so they did not want to leave because they felt that if they did, maybe law enforcement or whomever or family would put them in a nursing home afterwards. So, so there is many, many different psychological, sociological, economic elements to this challenge and problem of hurricane evacuation. So very, very significant. Uh, I wanna leave you with uh, this here. Uh, I would hope many of us have this already. If you don't, uh, please download it. Uh, the National Weather Service, as you may know, we don't have an app, but we worked with FEMA many years ago and uh, they developed this app here. Uh, you can download either in the iTunes or the Android, uh, wherever you get your apps, and it's free, and you can uh, program in a number of uh, locations, and you'll get alerts from us. So again, this right here, uh, I have my parents and uh, family members 
across the country and friends uh, have this as well. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it back to Shirley and I'm gonna stop sharing so I can come back on camera. Back to you, Shirley. Thank you, Brian. We've got lots of comments, lots of people who are saying the safety messages that you have shared with us are so impactful and they're gonna help, you know, they're gonna communicate with their friends and their family members on some of the things that you shared with us today. We've got lots of interesting questions. We'll start with the first one, which was about early on, you talked about the briefings and someone had asked if they can, those briefings that you do with the emergency managers, I believe, if those are available via email to the public. That's a good question. Uh, what we do is after we brief the emergency managers, and we do that only with the emergency managers when it comes to a landfalling uh, tropical storm or hurricane, we then send out the email briefing to our, and this is every National Weather Service office. So after we brief the partners, we send them out to a, a much larger email distribution list. And yes, the media gets it. And the media will then share that information either on social media. I've seen uh, some of our county emergency managers actually posting on Facebook, on Twitter, the full slide decks. So yes, it, it does become available, but a lot of the information that we share during the briefings is available from our National Weather Service websites. It's available from the National Hurricane Center website. And yes, all of it is public information. Thank you, Brian. Some other folks are saying yes, they like the tidbit that you said about taking an ax into the attic with you or a chainsaw or something. People are sharing some of their experiences here uh, in the question boxes. And again, keep those questions coming. People are saying that you know the similar lessons of that people are still learning the similar lessons that we still hear from stories back in the 19, 1900 storm, the Galveston storm, that you know why haven't we learned our lessons yet? Some people are saying that they told us to write our social security numbers on our hands or for ID. I mean, just hearing some of these stories of what people have have gone through. Someone had asked in some of these, uh, the slide that you share about, um, you were talking about fatalities, and there was one uh, one section that was marine fatality. What are those? That's a good point, because when we say marine, uh, there's some folks that may not know what we mean by that. So that's really anything uh, over the water. So it could be a boating accident. It could be someone that uh, a wave hit their boat and they fell off and drowned. It could be uh, we also have rip currents uh, that are usually itemized out uh, separately where people may, you know, come to town or want to get too close to the beach or, or worse yet, go into the surf and they're unfamiliar with swimming in this area. And we see a lot of that after tropical storms and hurricanes because there may be people from out of town. Uh, they may not be familiar with what a hurricane or tropical storm is or what a warp current may be. You know, someone coming in from far inland, it could be, you know, Oklahoma and they're coming to Florida and they're going into the surf because they want to be in the ocean and, and they get swept out by a rip current. So that is another significant uh, post uh, storm uh, risk. And that becomes what we call like an indirect fatality uh, when it occurs. But yeah, marine weather is anything uh, that has to do with uh, coastal water, uh, boating accidents and things like that. Thank you, Brian. We've got someone who has their a, a tidbit here to share with you. Uh, they're an extension agent in Collier County, and they've grown up in Lee County, and they found that sometimes those high water lines and buildings, you know, could be uncleared or inaccurate, uh, you know, as 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 the as they have uh, water levels sat in the longest making the debris line, and there could be multiple lines. So one strategy that they've used is they go into kitchens and they go into the cabinets and check for example, glasses, glasses of water, or you know, people that have their cabinets full of, of, of cutlery or, or, or plates, and they see if there are you know, waters, glasses of water filled with salt water, and that's another indicator that they've used to figure out what the high water mark is. Yeah, that's excellent, and that brings up another really good point. I'm glad that person brought that up. Is, and, and we were also yeah, down in Collier County and, and, and Lee County, so that whole area was, you know, had storm surge from Hurricane Ian. And, so there's two two different things there. So a lot of us will go out there, we'll be looking for the still water mark. So basically that is just the surge, how high did the water get up in an undisturbed area? So remember I showed that closet door with the gentleman at the gas station, you open up the door and you saw that that faint line of dirt. So that would have been how high did the water you know, get up the true surge. But there's also, we have to remember uh, wave action. So there's gonna be very 
strong wave action on top of that surge. And so that's where it could be deceiving sometimes. It's still going to do an impact. I mean, it's water. Uh, but when we do, when the National Hurricane Center does a, a storm surge uh, warning and how high it may be, that's going to be the the surge. And we always say there'll be waves on top of that surge. So while the surge may come up to 10 feet, there could be five foot waves on top of that. And that's sloshing back and forth. And that may further uh, damage and uh, compromise a structure. But no, that person's right. That's a really good clue. Like you could be looking inside glasses, inside cabinets, inside closets and seeing because that area is pretty well protected from wave action, but it won't be protected from how much water actually inundates the area. Yeah, we have folks that are sharing. Thank you. We've uh, shared uh, some folks that are sharing their experience from Galveston, Texas during Ike, you know, saying that in Galveston, the water line for Ike was way higher than any other storm, including the 1900 storm and speed up on our first floor walls on our stilted house in Jamaica Beach, Texas. Glad we are not staying there, someone says, because they were flooded six times uh, there. Uh, so just sharing that uh, anecdote there for you. Uh, someone's Maybe. asking about that that FEMA app. Go ahead. Oh. No, perfect. Yeah, I was going to say with Ike, you know, 2008, again, another very large hurricane. So again, the storm surge was amplified because of the very large wind field uh, that was around Hurricane Ike. And it looked like it was actually going to come to Tampa at one point. It was coming on in and then, you know, it, it kind of moved on towards the Texas coastline. And that was an evacuation nightmare where Galveston Island evacuated and then Houston started to evacuate while before Galveston could finish the evacuation. And unfortunately, there were people that lost their lives on the highway as they were trying to go farther inland. So again, another uh, disaster uh, with evacuations. But with the FEMA app, yeah, definitely go ahead. Yes, uh, someone's asking that, that, la that last slide, uh, the name of that FEMA app, because people want to download it. Is it just called the FEMA app? Yeah, I would just search for FEMA weather app and it's the only one that FEMA has and they work with the National Weather Service to develop it. So search your uh, either the uh, Apple Store or what's the other one called? Um, Google Play. Google, yeah, Google Play. I have I have an iPhone so <laughs> but yeah, I do search too. FEMA, FEMA weather app and it'll come up for you and it's free. All right folks FEMA weather app and you can also uh, get the, the weather service forecasts on, on that app. So, uh, so Brian, oh, so you you shared with us a lot of lessons learned. I know we're getting to the top of the hour. Uh, going into the season, is there anything you're going to change? Uh, you know, with with the way that you you message things or or the way you communicate to the public going forward, if a hurricane comes, you know, to your county warning area. No, we will. And, and we had, uh, we've already had several, what we call integrated warning team meetings. We had one, uh, we had two in April, one in uh, Southwest Florida. We had at Punta Gorda, we had one in Tampa Bay. Uh, we also had a special uh, risk management meeting for hurricanes in January. So it's the off season is is the busy time. You know, that that's when we go out there and we educate and we try to learn what can we do differently. And here at our office in Ruskin, just yesterday, we had a training workshop and and we were all here and we were we were talking about you know, how could we word things differently? We actually looked at the Hurricane Ian briefings uh, to emergency managers. Uh, some of them I showed some slides today and said, okay, how can we word this differently? You know, and so we're looking at, okay, well, we want to message just because you may not be in the cone or say the cone is shifting in any direction. We, we want to add on that the impacts are still going to be significant uh, in in and close to that area. And so we really wanna emphasize that impacts can occur well outside that cone. We've seen it with every hurricane and that's gonna be something more that we're gonna do. And, and we're really gonna be, when it comes to storm surge, we're, we're gonna be more, I'll say more blunt, more specific, more emphasized and just say, okay, well, if you do not leave, you will drown. You know, it, it, put it as, as bluntly as that, maybe that will get some people to leave if they didn't before. Uh, Cause when we say, well, if you don't leave, you're gonna experience 10 to 15 feet of water. Some people can't visualize that. They can't imagine that. But if we say, if you stay, you will drown, you know, maybe maybe that'll have a different impact. And it's been done before. It was done with Katrina and, and other storms. Uh, so we're looking at, and I say we, I mean the whole National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center is part of that, are looking at different ways we can message uh, not only the risk, but also the impacts from these storms. All right, well, we're a little, a minute past, but this was very informative, impactful, 
emotional as well as some of us have experienced Ian or other storms. Thank you, Brian, for, for being with us this hour, for, for sharing your, your experience. And thank you to those who attended. Again, if you missed anything or want to review the, the message that Brian has shared with us, we will have this recording available. Tune in next week as we will round, uh, we will round out our, our webinar series. We're going to hear a little bit more about inland flooding and how NOAA tracks inland flooding for other storms. You heard a little bit here with, uh, with what Brian shared with us with Hurricane Ian. There are other NOAA offices uh, that also track flooding. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you again and have a good day, everyone.